James, thank you so much for agreeing to take part in our Great Mind series. We're absolutely delighted to have you participate. Can you please start by providing our students and our viewers with an overview of Barclays Wealth, a brief history of the bank and the key services that you offer to your clients, please? Uh, okay, well, um, starting off with, with Barclays, uh, of, of course, um, a brand that is, is probably well known uh, to, to most of you. Um, but uh, just, just to fill in some of the details, uh, we've been around for, for a very long time. This is our 325th year uh, in business, which makes us older than the Bank of England and in, indeed the United Kingdom and the United States for, for, for that matter. Um, Barclays looks after 48 million clients uh, world worldwide and, and is a universal bank or what was previously known as, as a universal bank. So um, every day we're lending money, um, we're sending money, we're looking after money and we're investing money. Uh, we, within Barclays, we're, we're currently organised into four divisions, for want of a better word. Um, the investment bank, uh, we, we have uh, our Barclay card uh, division, uh, we have our African business uh, and the fourth business where Barclays Wealth belongs um, is PCB, so that's personal and corporate banking, um, which in itself um, is a huge uh, unit if you consider how many uh, personal and business clients uh, Barclays looks after uh, around the world. Bar Barclays Wealth itself um, is then subdivided into, into three parts. The business itself is about banking, it's about lending, uh, because even very wealthy clients uh, do want to borrow money. It's about investing, either on a discretionary basis um, or executing clients' own trades, or on advisory basis where uh, it's somewhere between uh, discretionary and, and, and executing um, on, on their own. Um, we help clients with wealth advisory services, which is wrapping their assets in order to protect them, um, perhaps um, a, a against a, a divorce or in order to make them safer um, if they come from a particularly unstable uh, part of the world. Like Greece, for example, at the moment. Greece, indeed, an interesting, uh, interesting area and part of my uh, part, part of my area yeah. of, uh, of responsibility. So we're, we're organised um, geographically. That there's virtually no wealth manager that is is truly global. Uh, we're we're quite international. We, we have a big operation uh, in the UK, our home market, as you'd expect. We, we have a large European operation as well, uh, which, which is based um, in, in Geneva, um, and, and we also have uh, uh, operating uh, centres in, in Monaco. Um, and we have a big uh, Asian, Middle East and African business as well. So that's, uh, that's the business. Okay, thank you for, for that overview. What are some of the key challenges facing the global wealth management industry, and how is Barclays positioned to respond to some of these challenges? The industry is, is definitely at uh, a point of inflection uh, uh, at the moment, and, and I've seen it described uh, that, that there is a revolution going on. I, I think that's true in banking for general, uh, generally, um, but particularly wi within wealth management. And it, it's changing um, largely because of technology, mm -hmm. um, and what clients are asking us to do um, is, is different. So technology is both an opportunity a and a challenge for us. Uh, I'm sure that you're, you're well aware that um, it's incredibly expensive to uh, develop new technology, uh, and particularly where you have to be super secure a as a bank for, for the very obvious reasons. So um, that's where uh, being part of a very large group like Barclays, um, it, it assists us. But you know, clients are now, they're more demanding. Yeah. Everything um, has to happen quickly. Um, so we, we encapsulate it internally as, as the need to provide smarter human banking. Um, smarter um, using the technology um, meaning of, uh, of the word. So uh, a, a large client may well want to see uh, the assets that they've got in, in Switzerland, um, in, in, um, in the Middle East um, and in London um, co-mingled uh, together so that they can get uh, proper performance attribution. Um, they don't actually mind uh, the fact that uh, you're dealing with three different legal jurisdictions, the data's in, in three different places. They just want it amalgamated because as far as they're concerned, um, it, it's their money wherever it happens to live. Um, they may want that uh, on a desktop, they may want it on, on a mobile um, device, they may want to, to uh, telephone us at, at three o'clock in the morning, um, and they certainly 
don't want to spend 15 minutes identifying themselves um, if it's not their usual point of contact. So um, the human element is definitely there and we're a relationship-based business. So um, the, the, the private banker is at the center of all of our relationships um, with clients, but it has to be supplemented with cutting edge technology. And to, to give you some examples of, of pieces of, of work that we've been, we, we've been uh, uh, conducting at, at Barclays, we, we have a very um, uh, well known now um, voice biometric system uh, wow. whereby the client rings up um, and within a very short period of time um, they have been identified um, through their voice and obviously um, we're, we're pretty comfortable with the security behind that. Um, we, we, we've got uh, fingertip uh, biometrics as well where uh, you, you have a reader on your desk, you put your finger in and that identifies you. Uh, video banking, mm -hmm. particularly for, for uh, clients who, who travel a lot and, and many of our clients are, are uh, very international. So um, it may be more convenient for them rather than coming to London or for the banker uh, visiting uh, the client uh, to, to do um, a, a video banking call. So th those are examples of, of things that we're, we're, we're working on alongside the more transactional um, pieces of, of banking that, that um, a lot of banks are developing and Barclays hopefully is, is leading. Okay. Wealth management has traditionally been seen as a very male dominated industry. What is Barclays doing to improve the gender gap within the sector? And the question that I really want to ask you is, in your opinion, does the glass ceiling still exist? It's an interesting, very interesting um, question, and uh, b because of the length of time that I've I've spent in in the industry, I could certainly see that things have changed and and, and for the better. Um, I would definitely agree. Probably ten years ago, and definitely twenty years ago, that it was male dominated. Now, I think we've all got further to go. Um, as an industry, um, Barclays has made um, a lot of progress uh, in, in uh, improving its gender diversity, um, but it is a journey um, and, and we're, we're, we're constantly looking um, at what we can do to, um, to improve our, 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 gender, um, our, our gender balance. Um, our client base, if you look at our client base, um, uh, diversity is important to the, our client base. Um, so I, I will have clients that ring me up and say, I would like um, a female private banker or a male private banker um, with these particular characteristics. So it's not just gender diversity that's um, important. We need to mirror um, our, the diversity that our, our client base um, has. So some of the things that, that, that we're doing um, at Barclays, because every single organization uh, talks about yeah. diversity and um, definitely um, every professional services firm um, talks about diversity and the need um, to, to improve um, the, the number of particularly senior uh, female uh, professionals that, that, that they have um, working for, for the firm. So um, we try and concentrate what, what we do into three um, areas. So. Um, the, the first subheading that, that um, I, I, would, uh, I would use is, is, is retaining what you have um, and ensuring when you recruit that you recruit um, properly um, and in an appropriate way. So that means um, that, that it would be usual um, for, for us to have a mixed gender interview panel okay. um, so that um, we, we ensure um, that, that we don't have uh, any unconscious bias yeah. um, slipping in anywhere along the way. Um, we, we've just rolled out um, what, what we're coming, um, what we're calling a, a welcome back program, which, which I think is really interesting. So that's for, um, for, for senior uh, female professionals who have had a career break, not, not within Barclays or indeed within banking, um, but want to come back um, and test the water. So they come back, they work with us for, for 12 weeks, um, and we hope that at the end of that period um, they, they will apply for, for permanent uh, positions with us. Um, That's really innovative because um, in academia, when in organizational behavioral studies, these are the key things that people are saying that need to be, need to be uh, taking place within industry, and it's great to hear that Barclays is doing that. Where are the skills shortages now and for the immediate future within, within the sector? There's been skill shortages within the sector um, as long as I've been involved with it. And um, the reason for that is that we're after a particular skill set. So um, 
when we interview for a job, typically um, we sift the CVs, and the CVs that, that land on my desk, they're all brilliant. They're, they're all, um, they've all got fantastic academics down there. So that's almost taken as read. Um, for wealth management, you need uh, a different toolkit. Uh, and we're looking for people um, that are people people. They have to be fantastic communicators, okay. first and foremost. Um, with international clients, we're looking for um, quite often for, for uh, people who are multilingual. Okay. Um, we're, we're looking ag again for that diversity, for the cultural diversity and um, different experience uh, within their, their previous working uh, wor working life. So it's a it, it's a particular skill set that we're we're looking for, um, and, and it's one area actually that uh, that is quite interesting because I, I quite often find the interviews are a disappointment, particularly where I'm recruiting MBAs, um, yeah. uh, people after, uh, that have finished a master's program, or, or even um, be before that, um, just, just finished their, their undergrad, uh, because we'll get a CV and it's brilliant and they've done some interesting things. But when they actually get to interview, um, it's a disappointment because they haven't thought enough about the interview and they're just generally not very interesting people. <laughs> so that's a, the, there's something in there, um, I, I, I'm sure, to, uh, to, to take away. Well, do you think um, the blame lies with business schools like us? We should be doing more to train these um, graduates? I, I don't know exactly okay. what your programs in, entail, <laughs> and I'm sure they're extremely full. Um, so um, for, for other lesser business yeah. schools, um, perhaps some of the soft skills yeah. are forgotten about um, in, in a, the achievement of, of the hard academics. But as I said, in the, the, the academic record is there and is taken as read, but the soft skills that, that lie behind that um, need, to be, need to be learned. And you don't see that, so you very rarely get a disappointing interview for someone that's been working for a few years. Um, you, you have a different type of experience um, as, as an interviewer, but, but um, you do occasionally get disappointments um, uh, be before that. I think, I think that's that. It's a, it's a great comment that you've made, um, and we've been drumming down this message to our students all the time. It doesn't matter how good you are at the academics, you could be achieving the best grades, but unless you are able to communicate, um, have good, strong, and interpersonal skills, it's very difficult to be, well, it's very difficult to be successful within the field. But it's good that you've mentioned that, and hopefully some of our students can take that on board. O obviously, for, for technical roles, it's yeah. less important, but, but wearing my wealth management yeah. hat, it's, it's very much um, up there towards the top of the list of the things that, that we're looking for. Okay, so this moves me on to my question about how organizations such as Barclays can work with higher education institutions. Um, what role does higher education play in terms of delivering future talent specifically for the wealth management sector? It, it's a difficult question to, to, to answer. Yeah. Um, because business schools turn out fantastically, um, fa fantastically good students now, or, or post grads, um, and that's the raw material that that, that we require. Um, I'm always, I'm, I'm constantly surprised actually by uh, recent graduates um, at, at, at all levels, really, at what they actually know, and, mm -hmm. and I, I think the the actual um, the course material is so much more relevant than it used to be. Um, so for um, those who are slightly longer in the tooth, um, like me, um, I, I am um, surprised on, on the upside with the technical skills, sure. um, the level of, of, of analysis um, that, that a lot of our, um, our, our less experienced colleagues um, are, are providing. So um, I, I don't think there's much that I, I would add that's missing other than the soft skills, okay. um, which are quite easy to pick up, but quite often neglected. The next question is regarding values and um, within, within the career services specifically we always tell our students that one's own values really need to be aligned with the values of the organisation that yeah. they work for. What does values mean to you James and in, in the realms of wealth management? I, I think the banking industry as a whole uh, is still repairing yeah. its, its reputation um, post, uh, post 2008. So we need to remember that um, a, as an industry. Um, and I think as a firm uh, as well, um, th there's virtually no large bank that has been unaffected by um, a crisis of one sort uh, or, or another. And 
it, it has caused us to um, to take a step back, I think, as an industry, um, and just say what's important to us. Um, it, it's it's been very interesting over the last few months, whilst we've been celebrating our, our 325th uh, birthday, to just going back to looking through the archives um, and and seeing what the values were when when Barclays were were set up. If, if you've walked into uh, the foyer in Canary Wharf at our, our head office there, um, you, you will see some massive, massive Perspex signs, which are um, the bank's core values. So respect, um, integrity, um, service ex excellence, and stewardship. So um, you can't miss them um, if, if you wander in there. But I would hazard a guess that any organization yeah. you care to mention will have something similar to that. I think what's different is how that organization lives those values. Sure. And, and I can't speak for, for other organizations, but I can speak for, for Barclays. Um, when a member of staff gets appraised um, a, a, at the end of the year, um, there are two critical things that, that we're looking for. And, and this is from the top to the bottom. Every single member of staff is appraised um, using the same methodology. Um, there, there's what we call the what, um, i.e. what they've produced. Um, and then there is the how, which links directly into the values. Um, and it's incumbent on members of staff uh, to proactively prove what they've done in order to further the values. Um, sure. So I, I do think that as an organization, we live those, we live those values. Um, we've certainly refreshed them um, and brought them further to the forefront of, of people's minds. Um, every single meeting room and office at Barclays throughout the world uh, has got a little perspex, a small perspex um, um, sign just reminding people of what the values are. And you will often hear in a meeting, um, yes, but values. Okay. Um, so we, we, are trying, um, we, we are trying to bring them into our everyday life. Uh, we certainly are everyday working life. Um, and and from, the, um, from, from the perspective of, of being at the heart of what we do, um, it's part of our performance management uh, okay. uh, appraisal system. The next few questions focus in you. Um, we teach a lot about leadership on many of our master's programs. What kind of leader are you, James, and what do you look for in people who work for you? I always think that's a, that's a great question, um, but probably not one to, uh, to, to ask the person who's, uh, who's doing the leading. Um, what, what would I like people to say uh, uh, about me if you were, if you were asking uh, my team? I, I would hope that they would say that I, I'm an authentic leader. Um, my view of leadership is, is that there is probably no one particular leadership style um, that I think uh, is, is dominant and, and used all of the, all of the time. Um, if you did put me into, um, in, into a, a category, probably um, I, I would like to consider myself as a democratic leader because okay. it seems to work well um, when you're working with the types of teams that I'm, I'm working with. And, and I, I should quantify that. Um, I don't work in a scale leadership model. So um, I could be uh, within Barclays running uh, call centers and very large divisions with, with thousands and thousands of people. Um, I run a relatively small team of um, specialists, um, some, some world global experts yeah. um, in there. So it's, uh, I like to think, a small and perfectly formed um, group of, of professionals. So I think that that requires a, a, a different skill set. Whatever you call yourself, though, as a leader, the, there are definitely some characteristics and, and traits that I, I think are, are really, really important. Um, integrity is one. Um, you, you, you just can't function um, if that integrity box I isn't ticked yeah. and at the forefront of, of your mind. Courageous as well is, is another word that, that I'd use because management and, and leadership in particular can, can be quite a lonely place and, and you need to have um, confidence in, in your own decision making um, to, to make the, the, the very tough um, calls. You, you need to be able to communicate crisply and, and with candor yeah. uh, as well. Uh, because you are dealing with different situations. Um, but, but most of all, I, I think being flexible is, is really, really important because different situations require a different skill set and uh, a different approach um, to, uh, to, to how you actually um, deal with it. Okay, so courage, communication, 
and flexibility. And integrity. And integrity. On there. And as tran uh, transparency is probably um, the, the final one that sure. I put in there because the more transparent you are, I, I think the more successful you are uh, as, uh, as a leader. Great. James, you've had a very illustrious career thus far within the UK banking sector. What have been some of your key career highlights and what is it about wealth management that still excites you? Uh, in terms of key career highlights, they tend to revolve for me around large transactions that we've done that have enabled a client um, to achieve a particular outcome because the transaction is only a means um, to, to an end. I still get moments now, even um, after thousands and thousands of, of client meetings that I've done over the years where I'm thinking to myself, am I really getting paid to sit in a room with this person who all of our clients are super successful people. Um, the vast majority have got very, very interesting stories. Um, they, they, have, uh, they have just different skills and different characteristics from, from the general population and that's what sets them apart. And I still have moments where I think, I, am I really getting paid um, to, to do this job? Um, it's, uh, it, it's a brilliant job. It's tough um, and it's a lot more competitive and a lot harder than people think, like, like most jobs and most professions. Um, sitting on the outside uh, looking in. Um, but in, in terms of, uh, of the key moments, they all feature. Um, it's about client, client outcomes, successful out client outcomes. Great. This moves me on to my final question. If you can give any advice to our students and graduates wanting to enter the wealth management sector, what would this be? I think if you want to do it, um, certainly look at it because it's a, it, it's definitely it's a growth area, um, it, it, it's an expanding area, there's always going to be wealthy people around. Uh, it's interesting from, from the point of view um, intellectually you will never be bored because the scope of the services that are offered they change, um, you're dealing with, with often very sophisticated um, product services and, and, indeed, um, and, and indeed clients. Um, so I think um, and I would say this, uh, having worked there uh, uh, in the industry as, as long as I, I, I have, um, it, it's a fantastic career. Um, if you're not interested in people, it's possibly not the right career um, for you. You need to have uh, an interest and a like uh, for, for people. Um, and if you go back to the, uh, the, 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 the traits that I said yeah. are important um, in, in the wealth management uh, uh, world, um, you have to be very honest um, and, and self-critical about do I really have those, those uh, characteristics and is that my, my skill set. If it is, I'd say come on in, um, sure. really. It, it, it's, uh, it's quite rare that people leave the industry, actually, um, okay. when, when, they, uh, when, when they join. Um, people enjoy it. it it's different um, from, from most other areas of, of, of banking. And, it, and it, uh, for, for me, it's in that nice position between commercial banking and investment banking. Well, that brings us to the end of the interview. James, thank you so much. On behalf of everyone at the London School of Business and Finance and Global University Systems, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you.